Hey, what's good, man? Heartless Garvey, baby. Hey, we reporting directly from the lab. You see me out here grinding, baby. We getting it in. And guess what? The Fair Music Podcast, episode two, is in the works baby let's go hey if you haven't seen episode one it's under thera music on youtube it's a video and um thera t-h-e-r-a music m-u-z i c get that and uh it's really good man we really the goal of the entire podcast is um exploring heuristics to raise the psychological resiliency of the next generation so very monumental task because we're trying to look into learning tools and and different ways of learning maybe associative learning to be able to broaden your horizons maybe even be able to look at diametrically opposed ideas things you don't agree with and find ways to dissect it intellectually find coherency get the meat from the bones and put the arguments together to have a more depth of understanding Right, so that's what we want to do here. And you see we have a nice little ambiance. We got a dope little setup. We got the lights. We got the um, uh, computers. We got, you know, the LEDs and everything is dope. But everything is in aesthetics, right? It's not just about looking good, you know. Obviously, you want to have good aesthetics because that's going to be what keeps people engaged. You want to be sonically pleasing, you know, sound-wise, because it is an audio podcast. Uh, We have some upgrades coming out. As you can see, haven't installed everything, we're working on it as well. But it's beautiful, man. It's definitely a beautiful ambiance. You can tell that we have a nice little setup. But yeah, that's not everything, right? The most important thing is what? The content of your message and the information that you provide. The podcast, is, it means a lot to me. It's something I've worked on for quite a while as far as the concept. It's somewhat of my magnum opus. You know, it's been a long time coming to be able to execute all this stuff and to be able to get somewhat of an insurrection away from dogmatic thinking and be able to analyze things on your own volition. Looking at some of the great men in anthropological history, some of the most uh, prominent, prestigiously held geniuses. People like, I'll give you an example. Leonardo da Vinci, right? Uh, Benjamin Franklin, um, N- Nikola Tesla, um, Zara Yacoub. That's an Ethiopian philosopher who predates European philosophers, the Enlightenment philosophers, by over a hundred years. And it's really attributed to him, not not a sense of plagiarism, but more of a sense of um, um, inspiration that a lot of his ideas are now mirrored or echoed by the philosophers that are more famous today. And the reason why I bring up these great men, these geniuses, is because they were considered what's called polymaths. A polymath is someone who has a level of expertise and mastery in different fields, right? And none of them really enjoyed school. Hmm, what does that tell you? I mean, school curriculum is highly propagandized. Um, The quality of the content of the curriculum may leave some wanting. And the most intelligent avant-garde leaders of generational thought are men who didn't like school. Okay, so how did they learn? Well, they were autodidactic. Okay, so what is an autodidact? That's someone who is auto, self, didact, taught, learner. So a self-taught learner. I think this is really important because if you are going to school as a child, you're going to learn just enough to be able to pass a test, right? But will you really retain the information as far as a high utility? But if I'm interested in something genuinely, oh my God, I'm going down the rabbit hole. We can go to the library, look up books on it, and now we got Google. It's the age of information or disinformation. But you have the accessibility to go out and get the information, right? So that's what I want to do. I want to encourage kids to pursue scholastic endeavors without thinking that it's nerdy or dumb or, you know, just any kind of stigma around expanding your knowledge and challenging your mind on a daily basis. 
So we're going to be doing book reviews. We're going to be doing movie reviews. It's going to be apolitical. We're not really going to go into that. Um, but I, I will want you guys to be open minded to looking at clinical psychological information, social sciences, um, studies, research, statistics, because a lot of these things, the information may not fit a lot of the misconceptions of public popular belief today. Associative patterns. So like your diet and how that affects your mental health. Now in Western allopathic medicine, it's now being recognized that the stomach may be the second brain. What does this mean? You have neuroreceptors in your stomach that go to your brain and that could be affecting your level or propensity for depression, um, circadian rhythms, you know, that affects mood, that affects um, cognitive ability. So it's a lot of really interesting information out there. Romanticism. Let's talk about it. The Roman era, needing to keep the attention span to people in dramatic presentations like theater, came up with romanticism. It still dominated consumerism today. R&B music, movies. Well, are the ideas of romanticism so patently false that it's holding us back as far as relationship competency? How did romanticism classically condition us in a somewhat Pavlovian manner to be handicapped thinking oh my partner should know what I think without me telling them oh there's a such thing as love at first sight oh there's a such thing as a soulmate oh sex and love are two things that are absolutely together they have everything to do with each other and there's no way sex can be over here and, and love can be over there hmm a lot of weird ideas coming from romanticism that set us back. We'll talk about that. Forgiveness. How how complicated is the concept of forgiveness? Is it easy? Is it nuanced? Um, infidelity. Wow. The psychology of the betrayed and the betrayer. I'm not excusing any side, but looking at things like, you know, potentially the evolutionary biological origins of psychological morality. How does this affect it? How did philosophers, how did scientists come up with theories and theses as to human behavior and nature? Where are we today? So there's a lot of information out here that we're going to be addressing, but I feel that's going to be helpful to people as far as a utility in their everyday life. I'm going to be doing some book reviews. As you can see, this is one of my favorite books ever. The master and the emissary. The right left brain dichotomy. Understanding how your brain works is something that every intelligent person probably should do because it's gonna give you a better overarching idea of who you are. Almost like just two people within you. It's very interesting. But that book is by Ian the Gilcrest, he's a neuropsychologist. The Myth of Mental Illness by Thomas Saas. It's a very, very interesting book. It's a 50-year comprehensive life work. He passed just recently. Uh, may he rest in peace. But Thomas Saas, spelled S-Z-A-S-Z. -S -S and the book is called Myth of Mental Illness. At one point, America thought that smoking cigarettes was a mental illness. Uh, we used to have coercive medicine where we would, you know, roughly put people, displace them out of their homes and put them in almost prison-like situations, brain lobotomies. So there was a lot of mistakes being made. And if you look at mental health today in comparison with where we came from, we made advances, but we're very short of understanding things like suicide ideation and, and chemical imbalances and things of that nature. So why would it hurt for a younger generation to be erudite in discovering and figuring these things out? And I want to encourage those minds. Let's look at some, look, look at some more of these books. So we have the history of philosophy. I love philosophy. I love psychology. I love try, trying to mix things, 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 things together. And by doing a juxtaposition, seeing what you can take away from that. High Octane Brain by Dr. Michelle Braun. Science-based steps to sharpen your memory and reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease. Wow. I haven't read this book, but I will be um, taking it in. We'll be doing a review of that as well. A 
shadowy history of demons and science by Miss Gemina Canales, or Gemina Canales, I hope I pronounced that right, but goodness, you see that, you see the, the topic, demons and science, hmm, hubristic, prideful scientist possibly, hmm, people falling for scientism, believing in the science almost like a religion, but even though the scientist may not be being very honest with what he's saying, hmm, Interesting. So there's a lot of information out here, man. We're going to be doing the episodes. They're going to be getting juicier and juicier. They're going to be a lot longer than that first pilot episode. So tune in. I'm very excited. Man, I'm, I'm ready to make waves, man. We're ready to put a dent in the universe. We're ready to help these kids understand. And we have a program called the Virtual Library Program. We're going to be giving out Kindles to kids in the most impoverished areas to encourage autodidactic reading. And by doing this, we want to load up the Kindles with whatever the child is interested in. So if a kid says he likes science, man, I'm giving him this free Kindle, but we're going to load it up with biology, neuropsychology, chemistry, um, neurology, physiology, and anything to do with science. We're going to load it up on that Kindle, and that way he can read it, he can delete it, he can do whatever he wants. It's his Kindle. He got it for free. But that's what we want to do for the underprivileged youth, right? So these are just some ideas that Theramis is coming out with. I would love your support. For the people who have been supporting me from day one, that helped me really accumulate all this information, that helped me accumulate all the equipment, facilitate this happening, the fact that you support me... In this moment of obscurity, these humble beginnings, where nobody knows who I am, words can't even describe the level of gratitude I feel towards you guys. And for anyone who hasn't checked me out or who's interested or maybe watching from a distance, check me out, man. Tune in because I think it's going to be very worth your while and you'll have some takeaways and things that you can take and understand um, maybe to a deeper level that could help you maybe in your life or possibly mentoring or some tutelage with somebody else. So that's it, I'm out, I'm done. I gave a whole speech, Heartless Garvey, baby. Era Music, YouTube, about to be on every other platform. We're getting all the distribution and everything ironed out. But check us out, baby, we doing it. We're gonna be theatrical, professional, and hopefully, uh, captivating for you guys. So I appreciate it. Crook, heart that I took, don't want to look. I know disaster is happening. Information I've been gathering says that we're lost in a labyrinth. According to the television, nothing's real, it's just relativism. But my love for you will always be true. Like the sun makes your melanin glisten. Is this real life or a dream?